are you doing? It's been a while since I made a proper big YouTube video. And what woke me up? Mandalorian, of course. My fictional husband, his mind, brought me back from the dead to the land of YouTube. I'm so excited to make this video because I was so, so thrilled that season three of The Mandalorian has finally arrived. I loved the first episode, I screamed, I laughed, I laughed even more and I generally loved it. Like from the Purgles, hello, big Rebels reference, are we gonna see Ezra? That is the question. And I love Purgles, they are my second favorite uh, Star Wars creature after the Loath Wolves. That was so cute. Also, we got so many hilarious moments between Dean Jarin and Grogu in the first episode, from Dean lashing him across the room as if he was a rugby ball, to Dean Jarin squeezing in that tiny little shop just to make sure that the Anzellans were doing their job right, to Grogu being a menace to the society. I loved it, I loved it all. And I was so glad that we finally saw a little bit more of the Mandalorian culture. I love Mandalorians, I love Mandalore, and it's so beautiful when we explore different cultures within the Star Wars universe. But let's move on. I am going to watch the second episode of The Mandalorian. Let's a go. You don't need redemption, Dean! Belly is back! I love Belly. Like, she is my spirit animal. Period. There he is! The girls who get it, get it. The girls who don't, don't. A Mandalorian. I like how he's teaching him about everything and he's opening up a little bit more. What is that? Is that Grievous' baby? <laughs> he's running with a potato sack on him. She got to hold it once more. I swear on my name and the names of the ancestors that I shall walk the way of the Mandalore and the words of the creed shall be forever forged in my heart. Hello, different day, new me. I just wanted to talk about some things that came up to me days after I watched the second episode of The Mandalorian season 3. It happens to me all the time, like usually I get so struck by the episode, so absorbed from what I've watched that I cannot really form any coherent sentences and days after I come up with like theories and full analysis and this is what I would like to do here. So first of all, the star of the episode was Grogu. There, I said it. <laughs> there is something about this green bean 
that just captivates everyone and it just he just steals the scene every time the way that now he has grown up a little bit and he can save Dean for exchange instead of Dean saving him all the time is so important that we see that because now the dynamics have changed and it's not just Dean protecting Grogu, it's Grogu protecting Dean as well. And I bet that when Dean told him to go and get bo when he was trapped by this grievous looking creature, I bet he was thrilled that he would zoom in his tiny pod and rush to get bo to Dean. I bet he was thinking, yes, I'm gonna do zoomies after all. <laughs> Run. And something tells me that now that he is in his toddler era and he's bubbling a lot and so cute, I think that he might talk by the end of the season. And I bet he's gonna sound like this. This is the why. This is the why. You know, like Yoda has his own way of talking. I bet that Grogu will have the same. And just the fact that he was saying Baku all the time, it was cute, okay? Less cute, please, next time. Baku. <laughs> also, tiny detail that just struck me. Pelly has lost a tooth and I feel that was from the episode with Boba Fett, actually in Boba Fett when that fight happened and she got knocked off and she lost her tooth. That's what it is. Second of all, we are at the point of Dean's journey where he feels that he needs to be redeemed because he disobeyed his creed by removing his helmet at the end of the second season. Which has caused a lot of discussion in the internet because people are saying that he doesn't need redemption. And I kinda agree with them because at that moment Dean choosing Grogu was more important than Dean choosing his creed and he did remove his helmet willingly. And I feel that Dean Jarn is a very relatable character to many people for many different reasons, probably because he's such a goofball sometimes. But one of the reasons why he's so relatable to people is because of the religious aspect of it, of his relationship with religion which does resonate with people, one, because many people have questioned their beliefs and if they want to keep following their religious beliefs, or because they carry a religious trauma that was caused by being forced to follow a religion that you don't really want to or agree to follow. And yes, being a Mandalorian for Dean is one of the most important things in his life, because first is quite literally what, what saved him in the Clone Wars because he could have easily died by the attack that happened on his planet which killed his parents. So okay, being Mandalorian is what literally saved him and toughened him up and made him this tough and hardened warrior that can be thrown into any environment and can endure and survive. You see what I did there with The Last of Us. But being a Mandalorian is not just that, it's following the creed, which to Dean's mind was just revealed by the end of season two because he didn't know that there were different aspects of being a Mandalorian. He always thought that being a Mandalorian is following the creed, never removing your helmet and just living according the way. And what I want from him in this season is to explore what a Mandalorian can be, what a Mandalorian can look like, not just what the watch is telling him to be, but um, what does he discovers a Mandalorian can be. Does that make sense? And even if he chooses to still follow the watch, by the end of the season, I think it's important for him to explore everything that are out there, to know the truth in its entirety. What I expected Dean to do in this episode was to question his own faith, because we are getting prepared that nothing magical happens in the living waters, there's nothing special about it, it's just all 
stories that people were telling the children. And we learned that through Bokatan. Now, it's too early to say if Dean will actually question his own beliefs, but what was interesting to me is that Bokatan was a person who had lost her faith, really, who was saying there's nothing special about this place, the mythosaur doesn't even exist, there's nothing special about the living waters. But what happened was that she questioned her own beliefs because she saw the mythosaur. And I don't know what that means about the two of them, if she will follow Dean or if she will train him or if she will follow a different path in being a Mandalorian. I don't know, but I'm very excited to see how the story will go from here. Um, if she will actually rule Mandalore again or if she will give it up and pass it to Dean and even pass it to Grogu really. At this point, Grogu is the, per the best person <laughs> to rule Mandalore. He's both a Jedi and probably he's gonna become a Mandalorian. <laughs> and something about the scene where Dean wanted to bathe in the living waters of Mandalore made me very emotional for some reason. His eagerness to get rid of his cape, <laughs> I thought that he would remove the entire thing, I was hoping actually, but the willingness he had made me feel very emotional, probably because Dean feels that without his creed he's not a man. And especially for people who follow religion, being right in the eyes of God is so important and without that you don't know what to do with yourself and this is what I felt from Dean. I don't know, I just wanted to go there and hug him and tell him that everything is gonna be okay and he doesn't need redemption. He's just as good as he is. And third, and the main thing that I wanted to talk about in this video was the lack of Satine's uh, name being mentioned. I got a bit disappointed that it wasn't mentioned like at all, but I think there is an explanation for it. So Satine was not only the ruler of Mandalore, not only was she bo sister, but she was Obi-Wan's former lover. When they were young they were both in love, so she was quite important for Obi-Wan. So of course if Satine's name was mentioned that would be the best thing to happen. Now I don't feel that bo is yet ready to talk about Satine, especially not in front of Dean, who she's not very fond of. He has something that she wants and she despises him for that reason. It was much safer for bo to talk about her father because she wasn't responsible for his death. bo I think that she carries some sort of guilt around Satine and that's why she doesn't mention her name. Probably she's not ready to talk about her. Not only Satine's actions led to, in a way, the destruction of Mandalore, but they led to Satine's death. Now eventually the person who actually killed Satine was Maul and he's the bad person in this situation. He just did it just to get under Obi-Wan's skin. But I feel that bo cannot help but feel guilty about it because it was her actions that led to Maul killing Satine. Now bo loved her sister, she respected her, but as Katie Shakov mentioned in an interview, probably bo doesn't realize that she should take responsibility of her actions. bo probably doesn't realize that she should face what she has done. In the current moment bo just mourns the loss of Mandalore. I just don't think that she's still ready to talk about Satine, because if she talks about Satine that would make it true that she had a part in it and I just don't feel that she's ready to face that. I hope that she will be ready at some point later on in the season, but I just think that we should wait and see how her character development will actually play out. But yeah, those were my thoughts about this episode. I love it so far. I cannot wait to see what will happen next. And until next time, may the forest be with you. This is the why. <laughs>